hey guys in this video we cover everything you need to know for extracting metals for your LXL chemistry now this is just a short summary of everything if you want to make sure you've covered everything in depth then you can go over to my website and download my free revision guide from there We can list the metals by how reactive they are, with the most reactive being at the top and the least reactive being at the bottom. Now you need to remember these if you have any good mnemonics, remembering these. Um, you can pop those in the description below, in the comments below, that would really, really help other people. Things that are above carbon need electrolysis to be extracted, whereas things that are below carbon can just be extracted by reduction. However, things that are really, really unreactive, like silver, gold and copper, are generally found in the earth as their pure ores, unreacted with anything. Everything else is generally going to be reacted with oxygen in the form of metal oxides. You can also use this to predict the products from electrolysis. If the metal you are um, uh, used in the electrolysis is more reactive than hydrogen, then you're going to get hydrogen as a gas. If it is less reactive, then you're going to get something else as a gas. And we can use this to predict the products for displacement reactions. If we reacted magnesium chloride with calcium, because calcium is more reactive than the magnesium, the calcium is going to take the place. So we are going to get calcium chloride plus magnesium as our products. However, if we reacted magnesium chloride with aluminium, because magnesium is more reactive, aluminium cannot take the place, it will not displace it, so no reaction is going to take place. There are lots of very important metals on Earth and some of them are very, very rare. So we need to develop new ways to get rare metals out of low yield ores. Low yield is where using traditional mining methods wouldn't be financially viable. Two of these methods are bioleaching and phytomining. Bioleaching is when we have a large body of water, say a lake, which has metal in it, such as copper dissolved in it. If we want to get the copper out of the lake, out of the water, we can add in bacteria. These will take up the um, copper from the water and then they will leach out copper ions. It's basically the bacteria's way. Another method is if we have lots of copper again in the soil but at very, very low yield. So not enough for us to dig up the soil and get the copper out, say, by reduction or electrolysis. We can put plants in. This is generally, believe it or not, broccoli. The plants will then absorb the copper ions from the soil. We can then cut them down and burn them. And then from the ash, we can do electrolysis. The disadvantage of using phytomining is that plants grow very slowly. Aluminium electrolysis is a slightly different form of electrolysis. We have one electrode up here, this is our positive anode, and another electrode down here, this is our negative cathode. The molten aluminium and the cryolite, cryolite is just um, a compound that is added to reduce the melting point of molten aluminium oxide. It's added into this reaction vessel and we get one reaction taking place down here and another reaction taking place at the top. At the bottom, at the negative cathode, we are going to be attracting the positive aluminium ions. They are going to be picking up electrons and turning into aluminium atoms. This is 3 plus, so it needs to pick up 3 electrons. And then at the top, at the carbon electrode, we are going to attract the negative oxygens. They are going to be losing electrons and turning into oxygen gas. Because we have two on this side, two oxygens on that side, we need two on that side. Which means we now have four negative charges, we need to lose four electrons as well. 
This is a carbon electrode up here and we are causing a, starting a reaction which causes oxygen gas to be evolved. Eventually the oxygen gas will react with the carbon electrode and we are going to lose the electrode as carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide will wear away the electrode eventually so this will need to be replaced. The molten aluminium collects at the bottom and can be taken off like that and that is how we purify aluminium. The earth provides us with many things including warmth from the sun, shelter from the trees, food from plants and animals, transport along rivers and we can get all of these from the rivers, the seas, the atmosphere and the land. When you're doing a life cycle assessment of an object, you need to look at the different stages of its life, the manufacture, the use and the disposal. And the environmental impacts of each of these sections. So the environmental impacts of the energy, so the energy needed for production of this, bearing in mind that this generally comes from um, fossil fuels which have been burnt, so electricity based on fossil fuels, leading to carbon dioxide being put into the atmosphere. The materials used, whether they can be used from um, natural resources or whether something else can be used, whether natural resources have to be further processed, the production of the product, using the product and disposal of the product. Using the product, does it need electricity to use it? Does anything come out of it when it's being used? Production of the product, we're talking about things like atom economy, how much of the um, reactants are actually going to end up in the product, how much waste is there, how much waste of the natural resources that went into it um, when you're making the product. And disposal of the product, can be it be recycled, can um, it be incinerated for another use or is it just going to have to go to landfill? This half arrow on top of the other half arrow going in the opposite direction is a symbol for a reversible reaction. Ammonium chloride will decompose into ammonia and hydrogen chloride gas upon heating and this is an endothermic reaction because you need to put heat into it. Cooling it is an exothermic reaction because energy will come out. Hydrated copper sulfate, which is a lovely blue colour, upon heating will lose the water, turn into anhydrous copper sulfate, which is a white colour. Adding water in will turn it back to hydrated copper sulfate. Lechitelier's principle tells us that whatever you do to a reversible reaction, the reaction will do the opposite. So in this reaction, this way is endothermic, and this way is exothermic. So if you heat up a reaction, the endothermic reaction will increase to compensate, and the exothermic reaction will decrease to compensate. Whereas if you decrease the temperature, then the endothermic reaction will decrease to compensate, and the exothermic reaction will increase to compensate, so that the overall temperature stays the same. If you're going to change the temperature of the concentration, the reaction will also adjust itself to compensate. If you are going to increase the pressure or the concentration, then the reaction will shift to the side that has less moles to compensate. If you're going to decrease, then it will shift to the side that has more moles to compensate. The Harbour process produces ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen gas. Our main source of nitrogen and hydrogen gas is getting them from the air. We can also get hydrogen gas from the electrolysis of water. They are fed into the reaction vessel where they will be turned into ammonia, which is a liquid, so that can be taken off at the bottom. And any unreacted gases can go back round into the reaction. It is done at 450 degrees C, at 200 atmospheres, and using an iron catalyst. The production of ammonia is very important because it is an important source of nitrogen for fertilisers. The conditions used in the harbour process are actually a compromise. 
the forward reaction is exothermic. So this tells us, using Le Chatelier's principle of dynamic equilibrium, that we should be using a low temperature if we want to drive the forward reaction. But at a low temperature, we have a low rate of reaction. So even though using the high temperature of 450 degrees drives the backwards reaction away from ammonia towards the production of the gas, the rate of reaction is so fast that it is constantly cycling between the two. So 450 degrees is a compromised temperature. The ammonia comes off as a liquid, so that can be taken off, that can be removed, which is also going to drive the forward reaction. There are less moles of product than there are moles of reactant. There are four over this side and two over this side. So high pressures of 200 atmospheres are going to drive the forward reaction because this is going to take up less space. There are less moles of it. A higher pressure would increase the rate of the forward reaction even more, but it would be dangerous because high pressure leads to risk of explosion. So 200 atmospheres is used because it is a relatively safe pressure to do it with. As we increase the pressure, the danger to the workers increases. The um, thickness of the walls increases and also stuff like insurance costs are going to increase.